Welcome to Living the Smarter Science of Slim, where we provide a scientifically proven lifestyle for long-term health and fat loss by eating more and exercising less, but smarter. Eat smarter, exercise smarter, live better. I am so ready for that. Hey everyone, Jonathan Baylor back with another bonus Smarter Science of Slim podcast. And today's show is one of those unique shows where I am I am as eager to listen to this show as I am to record it because today's guest is a man whose book I read many, many moons ago and had a dramatic impact on my life at that time. And I feel so fortunate to have the opportunity to talk with him today. And I'm so excited to share his message with you because it is, it's radical and it's honest. And that's the name of his first book, Radical Honesty. And we're joined by none other than Dr. Brad Blanton, who is a psychotherapist, author, seminar leader, and describes himself as white trash with a PhD. <laughs> so, Dr. Blanton, welcome to the show. Thanks. Nice to be here. Well, uh, Brad, just to get us started, uh, I, I want, if you don't mind, to focus on your first book, because you have, you have many, uh, Radical Honesty, and how you came... So, one, a quick overview of what you mean by radical honesty, and then two, how you came to that school of thought. Well, I was a psychotherapist in Washington, D.C. for over 30 years. And so it was only natural that I became an expert on lying. <laughs> <laughs> because that is the best place in the world to become an expert on lying. I love it. <laughs> I saw a lot of people work for the government, a lot of people work for industry related to the government. I saw more lawyers than any other single profession over the course of the years of my private practice. And uh, basically, I, I learned from my clients that the fundamental cause of most anxiety, most conflict with couples, most trouble at work, uh, most depression is being trapped in the jail of your own mind. Hmm. And that what keeps you trapped in the jail of your own mind is lying and that we all lie like hell all the time. <laughs> it's true. It's true. So, so what, how, how do we become radically honest? You start just saying whatever it is that you notice. So you can notice what's going on outside of you. You can notice what's going on in your own mind and you can notice what's going on in your own body. And that's all there is. There isn't any more. Just report what you notice. And, what and that is radical simply because it doesn't fit in with the usual conspiracy you're supposed to be engaged in with other people to play like. Something is different than it is. And Brad, one thing I, I want to call out in just violent support of what you just said, because it may seem a bit radical. Well, <laughs> yeah, and intentionally, it may seem a bit radical to people. But I remember a section in your book, Radical Honesty, that just really hit home with me. And that was, I'm going to paraphrase and probably butcher it. So please correct me here. But when you're in a relationship with someone, so often we act the way we think that person wants us to act. But if you do that, you will never actually know love. Because even if your lies make that person love you, they don't actually love you. They love your lies. Yeah. And I was just like, oh my gosh, that blew my mind. Good for you. That's pretty good. You got it pretty good the first time through there. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, and could you elucidate for us, please? Well, the thing is, we all are imagining what other people are imagining about us. And we are taught to do that systematically by the way we're raised, the way we're parented, the cultural context we've come up in, is that what you're supposed to do is to play to an imagined audience and to try to maintain your identity. And your identity is your performance. We're taught from early childhood that we're the grades we make and what the teacher thinks of us. And then we get to be adolescents and we are who, what our peers think of us. And we live in an adolescent culture, which constantly reinforces that your identity is your reputation. So we're all suffering from a case of mistaken identity. 
because who you are is actually a person sitting there in a studio talking to me right now. And who I am is a person sitting in a chair talking to you on Skype. We're making a recording to be broadcast. Who I am is this present tense noticing being. And who you are is this present tense noticing being. And if you simply report what you notice, you report what's going through your mind, you report whatever you think about whatever's being said, you report whatever's going on right now. And when you do that, you end up violating a lot of ongoing cultural taboos that have to do with staying in the little game of playing like no one is pretending anything. <laughs> in fact, we're almost all pretending most of what we're saying most of the time. Brad, it seems like the thing that is so freeing and profound about what you're teaching here is and we all know this on some level, we know that one of the reasons we don't want to lie in the traditional sense is because it's very difficult to maintain because you have to remember, oh, I lied about this. So the next time the person asks me, I have to remember that I lied and da, da, da. Cause you have to create, you have to create N number of alternate realities where N is the number of people you're interacting with. And exactly. how, how yeah. much how much of our stress, our need for SSRIs just comes from trying to live a schizophrenic life of maintaining a set of lies? Yeah, I'd say most of it comes from the distraction of having to try to desperately remember what game you were playing with who the last time <laughs> and whether or not you actually told them something that you have to keep telling them something else to maintain or not. So you're constantly distracted. Like the mind is not your best friend. I call it the distractor tracker. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, you're constantly worried about uh, remaining uh, uh, nurturant of a particular kind of image. Mm. And uh, actually, I don't teach people to get smarter. I teach them to get dumber. <laughs> and, uh, in fact, after about almost 20 years of running this workshop, eight day long workshop called The Course in Honesty, we came up with a chant that leads to enlightenment without fail within two and a half minutes. And I usually charge people 2,400 bucks for this, but I'm going to give it away tonight right here on your show for free. Oh, but no, see, now I'm going to have to charge 1,200 bucks for people to listen to this show. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. But anyway, the chant that leads to enlightenment without fail within two and a half minutes is this. Duh. <laughs> uh, you just get dumb and stick. And if you slobber, you can get there in a minute and a half. And you just you just become completely unsophisticated like a child. You just say whatever the hell comes out. And they deal with it. And they can deal with it. And everybody deals with it. It's a whole lot funnier life. And you end up being happier you get paid more and given more responsibility and get laid more often. All these <laughs> wonderful things come out of that <laughs> that come from being just as dumb as a box of rocks. You know, it's like when you get dumb, you, you lose the cultural sophistication and you start being honest and lovable like children are. Mm. And another word for dumb, Brad, is simple. And, yeah. and, and it seems like that's also another way to think of this is literally it's, it's the old kiss, keep it simple, stupid, but yeah. really applying that to every aspect of your life. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and Brad, I wanted to call out some specific, I have this, I'm going to share a little bit about myself here. So mm -hmm. I was very much a reading books like yours. I mean, I just went on a binge for, for about three years when I was in college and I have this giant document, 40 pages long of like my favorite quotes that I captured. And I have a bunch from you, but I had two that are short enough to share on this podcast. And the first, and these are all from your book, Radical Honesty, which honestly, folks, honestly, go to Amazon and buy right now. Like right, you can probably buy it used at this point for 99 cents, but buy a new version. <laughs> But so the first quote, <clears throat> Brad, this is from page 120, and I'm just hoping you could talk to it a little bit, is uh, as follows. Neuro <clears throat> excuse me, neurosis is essentially a refusal to accept what is happening in the present. A neurotic is a person who incessantly demands that life be other than it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
that definition of neurosis is from people that preceded me. That was from Fritz Perls talking about Freud. But basically, Freud said something very similar, that that the incessant and constant demand that life be other than it is, is the essential nature of neurosis. It's, it's the way you make yourself constantly unfitted and unfitting into the world. The world, you have certain expectations the world is supposed to live up to. And so that guarantees your unsuccess mm. in your relationships and business and with friends, with your mate, whoever it is. It's like basically this incessant demand that they be other than they are also gets incorporated into your own mind and you're incessantly demanding that you be other than you are. Mm. And so you're out there demanding that everyone, including yourself, be other than they are. And uh, it's a lot simpler just to be however you are. <laughs> and, and not only to be that way, Brad, but it seems like, at least again, I'm going to do some, I feel like we may be having our own psychotherapy session here over the phone. Don't send me a bill. Is uh, The more I've just even recently, I this is a much more colloquial way of, of phrasing some of what we just talked about, but it's the old fr phrase of playing the hand you're dealt. And the more I've done that, the more I've said, okay, this is the situation. It is. It is. Now, how can I actually use that to my advantage? Because it's two levels. One is like being neurotic and saying, hey, why is it this way? Blah, blah, blah. Next level is it is. But I think there's even a level beyond that, which is like, how do I use that to make the best life possible? How do I play the hand I'm dealt? Does that make what, what, what do you think about that? I say that you consistently play it out loud. You say to people, this is what I'm thinking. How can I make the most of this? Mm. And when you share that honestly, then they say, yeah, that's not a bad idea. Or I'm thinking about what I'd like to make the most of myself. Mm. And sharing at the level of your, you know, this is not new. You know, Patanjali wrote the Yoga Sutras about 5,000 years ago. And yoga had been around for about 5,000 years. And the second sutra, which is the one that comprehensively covers what all of yoga about it was. Yoga had been around for 5,000 years and all kinds of continents and different languages and lots of teachers and bhakti yoga and karma yoga and all different kinds of yoga, the yoga of common everyday life and sexuality and everything. All of yoga was defined in the second sutra. And the second sutra is the objective of all yoga is to bring about an inhibition of the modifications of the mind. Mm. And to inhibit the modifications of the mind, it doesn't say to obliterate it or do away with it or overcome it. It just stutter step the sucker every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> so that little bit of reality came through, you know? You let a little reality peep through now and then. <laughs> <laughs> and your own mind is not your best friend. We're taught in our culture that your mind is everything, but your mind is not that great. You know, basically, your mind is mostly a distractor tractor that's constantly removing you from noticing what's actually going on with you or with the world. Mm. And uh, really quickly, Brad, just for, for listeners who may not be as familiar with, like, w when we say neurotic, are you saying a, a crazy person? Like, what, what, is, what, is a, what is neurosis? What is a neurotic person as distinct from, like, a schizophrenic person or someone who is just crazy? Well, it's just someone who is distracted all the time or who's upset or who's anxious or who's depressed because they're constantly – uh, speaking to themselves in their own mind about what ought to be other than it is. Mm. And that's most of us, like basically the standard operating procedure for survival in this particularly neurotic culture we came up in is to be neurotic. <laughs> so it's reinforced. It's like it's a part of the Judeo-Christian tradition to worry about whether you're doing what you should be doing right now or not. Mm, it's it's like that constant self judgment. It seems, yeah. 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 Well, Brad, I just just one definition uh, that of neur neuroticism that I wanted to share with the listeners while we're on the subject. I think this actually came from uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer, and he. I was listening to one of his talks on this was a while ago on an audio cassette, and he said, "I thought this was funny, and I'm curious to get your take on it." 
if you have a, a fully functioning person and, and you say to a fully functioning person, what does one plus one equal? That fully functioning person will say two. All right, good. If you ask a crazy person what one plus one equals, they will say elephant or something ridiculous. But And if you ask a neurotic person what one plus one equals, they will say two, but they will say, but I can't stand that it equals two. <laughs> <laughs> good. I like that. I like it. It's usually free right on. And he's like, and why does it always have to be two? Just once. Couldn't one plus one equal three? <laughs> it all depends on your context. You know, one plus one equals 11, if you just look at it literally. <laughs> oh, I, I, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Brad, I think hopefully folks will start to, 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 to understand these quotes just based on what we're talking about so far here, because there's definitely a common thread. But this one's really short and just wanted you to comment on it here. And, and you say this was on uh, page five. So very early in the book, stress is not a characteristic, excuse me, stress is not a characteristic of life or times, but of people. Yeah, that you are the source of your stress. Is you don't have a stressful job, you just have a stressful way of trying to make yourself live up to the expectations you generate by thinking what must be required of you for that job. Mm. And Brad, how do you, does anyone ever say, well, like, Brad, are you, are you just proposing I stop caring? Because, like, should I just not care about my job performance? You just need to care less about what your ideals are, about what your idea of how you should perform your job. Basically, uh, the, the way of working through the things that comes to children naturally. Again, my favorite people are like between about like six months and nine years of age. <laughs> <laughs> because basically... There, we, we play pretend games, and it's wonderful. I love playing pretend games with little kids. You know, let's play like anything. We can play like we're the Lone Ranger or Star Wars or whatever happens to be crossing our mind. We can pretend anything, and pretend games are a lot of fun. But the problem is that at about 10 or 11 years of age, we learn this another level, another level of which we're, we're pretending but we're pretending that we're not pretending when we are. And it's that pretending that you're not pretending when you are that I call lying. Mm. Radical honesty is the antidote to that lying. You say, let's pretend together that such and such. That's fine. It's an open book. Everyone realizes we're pretending. But when you say, you know, I, did, I made a certain score on my SAT, and I could have done better, except such and such. This is all a whole bunch of pretense that has to do with, you might have not even told the truth about the score. <laughs> it has to do with you wanting to make an impression in the mind of the other person, that you're pretty smart, but probably even smarter than it looks like you are. Mm. Pretending, when you're pretending that you're not pretending when you are, this is the entanglement that gets you all wrapped up in a, in your mind's distractible behavior. Very, very well stated, Brad. Well, I can imagine that some of our listeners are thinking to themselves, and and I want to I want to warn our listeners here. I'm I'm going to bring up the subject of religion. So if you want to turn off the podcast, I would advise doing that. And certainly we'll be respectful here. But I, I'm I am curious to get the good Dr. Blanton's opinion. So oftentimes there's there seems to be a little bit of a paradox here, Brad. And I'm going to use Judeo Christian tradition and specifically uh, the New Testament of of the Bible. And most people would say, for example, I was raised Catholic. I'm no longer. Uh, practicing Catholic, but oftentimes people say, you know, religion is a major source or would be a major source of this internal monologue. But at the same time, if we look at uh, Matthew uh, chapter 18, verse 3, it says, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven, which actually sounds shockingly similar to what you're saying here. Yeah, by accident, there is some pretty good stuff in the New Testament. <laughs> <laughs> No, actually, there's a lot of similarity between the processes that I recommend that have to do with people getting over things by paying attention to their experience and sticking with it. Like, I believe personally that forgiveness is the most important thing an individual can learn. Mm. Now, you don't learn that much in the established church. You sure as hell don't learn it in the Catholic church. Mm -hmm. You learn an idealism about forgiveness, 
But authentic forgiveness is something that happens in your body. When you stay present to the experience of anger and you tell the truth about it, you get angry and it increases, then it decreases, then it goes away. And you say, oh, well, it's okay. I don't care that much about it anymore because you've gone through the visceral experience of getting over it. Or you get mad at someone for hurting your feelings or you get hurt by what they said. You feel the hurt. You have an increased heart rate. You feel certain sensations in your body. You stay with them. You tell them the truth about it. They talk to you. Everybody shares everything. Then eventually it's not so important to you anymore. You say, that's okay. I'm over it. That's authentic forgiveness. Mm -hmm. It's not forgiveness because you should. You can't forgive anyone because you should. You can forgive someone by going through an honest interaction, feeling what you feel, telling the truth about it, experiencing it. And then when you experience an experience, it comes and goes. Whereas if you resist experiencing, it persists. And one of the ways of resisting experience is by telling yourself you should be doing something else rather than what you're doing. And that's a way of blocking getting over it. So that the ideal of forgiveness prevents forgiveness often. Whereas the process of forgiveness is the most valuable thing because it leaves you open to a new moment, a new interaction with the person without past grudges and holdbacks shading what's going on well brad i think this is there's there is so much goodness here and i i want to caution our listeners because i think someone who might be multitasking while they're listening to this podcast and not and not listening uh paying paying as much attention as they should be might be hearing a message of like oh just just stop caring and 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 blah 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 but what i actually the two words that stuck in my mind after re-reviewing your work dr blanton is is authentic and cool and let me explain why i say this really clearly we try to often say like what makes a person cool for example trying to be cool is the least cool thing you can do because when you try to be cool you're lying and we often think that People who are cool are actually people that just embody what you're saying, radical honesty. They say what they think. They live what they do. They just – they do their thing. Mm -hmm. do yeah. you, I, I almost think radical honesty is at the core of what we as a culture define as, as truly cool and, and being authentic. What, what do you think? Yeah, I think so. I think probably what happens is when you don't worry so much about what's going on in other people's minds – and you don't worry so much about what's going on in your mind. And you figure, well, we'll work it out. If we misunderstand, we'll clarify because we'll keep telling the truth till we figure it out together. Mm. And it's a certain trust of the, of the being of the other human being rather than a trust of their minds. Once you see how your mind uh, is an unreliable instrument for you, you see how it's an unreliable instrument for other people. So you develop this kind of compassionate perspective I call screw them if they can't take a joke <laughs> <laughs> and it sounds at face value like it's uncaring but it's actually much more caring for the being over there you're not going to conspire with them to do what their mind says you should do either mm -hmm. because you're helping them deliver themselves from their own mind while you're delivering yourself from yours and I think there's a meta level here that you're talking about, Brad, and even the, and there you described it as when you look at it on the surface, it looks one way, but when you actually look deeply at it, it looks a, a, a much different way. And in fact, one, one other, one last quote that I want to share is, again, people may, who are not really listening here, may think what we're talking about is not caring. And in fact, that's the opposite. It's, it's, a, it's a deep, fundamental form of caring. And in fact, you mentioned in your book the primary, fundamental, essential, baseline, critical, lowest level, minimum requirement for happiness is yeah. a willingness to take care of one's self. Yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, uh, the what most relationships don't work. You know, people fall in love. They fall in love pretty quick because they sort of idealize how wonderful it was when they first got together, and then they start holding each other accountable for continuing to do that that way. So I, I suggest that people get over appreciation as well as over resentment. That is, you need to get over the last time you fell completely in love in order to be open to loving again. Otherwise, you're holding that remembered love as a standard 
that the person is supposed to live up to at all times, and you'll end up getting angry at them for not, you'll end up in an old hillbilly song. Why don't you love me like you used to do? Why do you <laughs> worn out shoe? <laughs> <laughs> and so what happens is that the mind is a tricky thing. It constantly uh, you builds a new delusion about how things ought to be. Like even when you're saying to people, if you're multitasking, not listening too careful, you should listen. No, they don't need to keep on multitasking. Just <laughs> listen to this in a sort of a halfway way. And don't worry about whether you get it or not. Don't concentrate too hard. It'll seep through and ruin your life anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what we're after is a kind of uh, loving casualness. Mm. You know, there's a lot of humor in the way minds work. You know, there's nothing like a mind. I say that every day. I mean, show me a mind and I'll show you someone that's about to screw up. (laughs) So it's like the being that, you know, for years and years in the history of existentialism, there was this ongoing argument for about 300 years from Kierkegaard on the way forward to Oh, I don't know, Camus, Nietzsche, all the, they, they were talking about the difference between being and doing. Doing is something you organize with your mind, and being has to do with noticing. And finally, Sartre said after 300 years, you cannot separate your being and your doing. And they, they argued about it, and they realized you need both. And nobody knew exactly what to do about it until finally the greatest philosopher of the 20th century, Frank Sinatra, (laughs) said, dooby dooby (laughs) doo. So what you get to do is to alternate being and doing. And they're both okay. You just don't want to have, like, if you're totally wrapped up in being, you're only in the present, you're basically pretty much unable to function. If you're all wrapped up in in uh, doing so that you have to constantly be working on whatever your next agenda is, you don't get to notice anything. So like Frank Sinatra said, you just alternate being and doing. You go dooby dooby doo, dooby doo, dooby dooby doo. And basically dooby dooby doo is the happy way to live. It's like you get to be and do both. And you get to engage other people as one being to another. And you get to talk about ideas and work on things together and that's the way that truly co-hearted co-intelligent deep democracy rich life that's where it comes from it comes from people doing dooby dooby doo together ladies <laughs> and, and gentlemen his name is dr brad blanton brad i got i have some other questions but i'm like that is so money we just have to end on that because <laughs> that's that's wonderful and uh hopefully folks as you heard here uh, I, I actually feel lighter. I literally feel lighter just from talking with Dr. Blanton because uh, his work is is enlightening both literally and figuratively, getting us out of our own way, getting us out of our own minds. And like he said, dooby dooby doo. So, <laughs> Dr. Blanton, thank you so much for joining us today. I very, very much appreciate it. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. And listeners, this I know Dr. Blanton said I shouldn't tell you what to do, but I'm going to tell you what to do. <laughs> Go visit RadicalHonesty.com, just RadicalHonesty.com, and grab a copy of the book, Radical Honesty. It is fabulous. And please remember, this week and every week after, eat smarter, exercise smarter, and live better. Talk with you soon. Wait, wait, don't stop listening yet. If you like the podcast and if there's other ways we can help you, please join us in the Smarter Science of Slim support group, which is freely available at the Smarter Science of Slim website, smarterscienceofslim.com. There you'll find all kinds of free recipes and success stories and just all kinds of fun stuff, like how to help your kids go sane and just great community content. And just one last thing before you go, if you wouldn't mind heading over to iTunes and up onto Amazon.com and leaving us a review and then going over to Facebook and liking us, we would hugely...